all really for years, and since the instigation of it uh, five years ago, uh, this year was a very important one, and I'll tell you why. One reason is that we uh, gained the, actually the School of Theology here in Clermont, uh, the possibility to install a chair, the Kilsby Family John B. Cobb Chair in Process Studies, which I think is unique right now. And secondly, also we have a new uh, PhD program in Process Studies, both unique and in a sense a very good support system for the wider research and the other way around. I hope so in the future I do know contributing to that in a sense. The third issue is very interesting one is we got our two books from our first two conferences this year. So the first one was uh, on uh, Deleuze, Whitehead, and Mathieu. Uh, the second one on the late work of Whitehead. The first one, Event and Decision. The second one was called Beyond Metaphysics? Question mark. And we have a third one in the making. Uh, we had uh, the possibility to get uh, Julie Butler last year to come here to talk about her own work and uh, Whitehead. And that will come out soon. Uh, further related to the second book, we also installed a new series, uh, the Contemporary Whitehead Studies. So I hope really uh, maybe some of you will in the future contribute to that series with very original, uh, unimaginably wonderful books that will come out in relation to Whitehead. Finally, uh, the most important thing that we gained this year is a letter in the summer of the Whitehead Estate that grants the project publish all of Whitehead's works, published or unpublished, and regardless of existing co uh, copyrights. So we have a go-ahead for the first critical edition of Whitehead's works at all, never happened before. Since. And there is a uh, committee, a publishing committee, and an editorial committee ready to place and have begun their work. So if you are in any sense interested, uh, just go to the homepage. It should be on here, whiteheadresearch.org. I get for information if you, you know, want to edit a text or be on the board and so on. I have to thank a lot of people and uh, institutions for this conference. A uh, uh, first person that I have to mention because of his wisdom that made you come here and so it's the fact that he co-created is my co-organizer sitting here, Michael Haywood. Uh, also, uh, there's numerous students of different programs who have helped this program to come about. Especially, I want to mention two. Uh, one of them, uh, you might have already been in contact and even think he has the ability of uh, all presence, only presence. And that's uh, Jeremy Fuckenfall sitting in the back very humbly. <laughs> And then the other person I have to mention is Brian Donaldson, and if you don't have seen her yet, uh, you will soon. Uh, she is, uh, among other things, um, uh, made it possible that you got a very nice hotel. So for the, the persons who have been already the veterans, so to say, they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, there's also some uh, institutions I have to mention. The, um, it is a pleasure that uh, we have Julie Jones here, who is a participant, but also part of the uh, Kevin Hawking Foundation, who has greatly helped for the financial, financial let's say, fluidity uh, of that conference. And there's, of course, the uh, School of Theology that had housed uh, this afternoon's lecture or conversation with Isabel Stengers, if you have been there. And there is the CGU, the uh, Claremont Credit University, at which we are right now, with several of its institutions that help uh, financially and otherwise. So, for instance, the interdisciplinary division, uh, also the School of Humanities, or Arts of Human and Humanities, that help financially with the Bradshaw uh, Fund. And we uh, have also to thank the School of Religion of that university uh, for the most important thing, namely to use their facilities for food. And if you don't believe me, that that's the most important thing we'll see later in life. So, um, having said that all, I guess uh, <coughs> we can just begin this conference. And I hope you will enjoy it. And I take it as a success that you are here, all of you, right now. And now I hand over to Michael. And of course, we 
we'd like to thank Roland for uh, all his sterling work and effort continuing and over the past four years uh, with the Whitehead Research Project and all these conferences. As he said, I'm Michael Hellwood. Um, I think you all know why you're here. We're very lucky to have Isabel Stengers and Donna Haraway. I'll be as quick as possible. The format is that Isabel's going to talk um, for roughly 35, 40 minutes. Um, then Donna is going to uh, respond. And after that, we will have questions from you. So that's enough from me. We'll get going. Thank you. And thank you for organizers being in invited in Germany, something you cannot refuse when you are I'm interested in why did I go in the Mecca. <laughs> so I, usually I turn to the Mecca to, for my prayers, now I am in it. <laughs> so uh, my talk is for its title, Civilizing Realism. Uh, philosophy, wrote White Head, never reverts to its old position after the shock of a great philosopher. We are not gathered to envisage reverting to Descartes or Leibniz's philosophy, all the less so as they themselves did not know that they would be classified in the category of speculative philosophers. It may be said that with Kant creating such a, con a category, a new proposition did enter our world and created as every new proposition a before and an after for all the experiences that would entertain it. As White Ed characterized it, the question, what do we know, was transformed into the question, what can we know? Of course, such a transformation was never exhaustive. Again and again, original thinkers have escaped the restriction. Uh, among them, I believe that Whitehead occupies a very special position. Since we are gathered here about the question of things, I would illustrate this position by imagining how Whitehead, who once it is told associated reality with being in the middle of a rugby pack, would answer this question. Maybe he would just say, use comments. Not only Whitehead, as a speculative philosopher, never positioned himself against common sense, but it may even be proposed that the cause he was serving when he turned into a philosopher was a defense of common sense, as attacked by theory. As is well known, Whitehead's revolt against what he named the bifurcation of nature was in the name of common sense, of what we do know even if we cannot theoretically justify it. And we also know that this bifurcation still rules today, creating new absurdities of reproducing old ones under the guise of new great questions, such as the emergence of feeling of value from blind interconnection between blind and indifferent processes. How to understand the awesome capacity of what White diagnosed as absurd, its capacity to infect its environment again and again, producing a divide between what should matter and what we do not need to pay attention to. White himself provided an answer. The great and dangerous innovation of the 19th century world has been the discovery of the method of training professionals then defined as vectors of progress, but a progress in a specialized group, demanding that no further attention be paid to what the group knows. But the question may then be raised of the way their environment tolerated what may be described as a general attack against common sense, the only agreement between professionals being that it's protest, the protest of common sense, should not be allowed to matter. And it may well be that such a question of <coughs> uh, the tolerance uh, begins with the professional themselves. An interesting hypothesis, indeed, is that the power of, of abstraction, their misplaced concreteness, and the always recurrent, but can we know critical question, are to be related to what Bruno Latour 
as described as a, a flying backboard. The moderns, he wrote, would turn their back on the future they run towards, looking to the past, a mobile and frightening past they cannot distance, which will engulf them if they do not run. What us back to the cave has been the answer to protest rather commonsensical ones against our very unsustainable development. And the cave here is not only that of prehistory, but Plato's cave, the realm of irrational beliefs, always ready to conquer, to conquer the present. Because of the cave, it would be our duty not to slow down and pay attention to the consequences of our actions for the future. It may well be that the power of professional abstraction, the only point of agreement of which is the disqualification of common sense, relates progress not with trust but with fright. Installing of such a fright may be narrated but no narration will explain the front. It functions rather like what White calls propositions infecting experience. Each invoked justification is a food for the proposition, and this proposition has for its direct consequence the definition of progress as what must be imposed for their own good to recalcitrant, frightfully irrational others by those who know better. As we know, this has become the refrain for the colonial conquest of the world. But this conquest has begun on the very urban ground and is still proceeding. Others are also us and what we do do. The more a so-called scientific proposition hurts common sense, the stronger its claim to react rationality. We deal here with what I would define as a very touchstone for what we may call, one way or another, speculative thought. Either speculation takes us still further from the others, verifying that our very strange adventure puts us again and again in the very classical position since Plato of getting access to a truth that would permit to guide the others out of the cave of, it, of, the cave of illusions, or it helps our abstractions and those who deal with them to present themselves in a civilized way that is without insulting those we present ourselves to. The second option situates me and my interest for Whitehead, knowing that this option for civilization may not be sufficient because of the self hate mistrust and resentment that has been induced, knowing that it is the least we can do as philosopher and non-philosopher. Invoking common sense in this context is thus evoking a defeat, not some universal anthropological consensus, something everyone on this earth would subscribe to, bringing peace and mutual understanding. When Whitehead defined philosophy as a welding of imagination and common sense, into a restraint upon specialists, he trusted common sense not as some innate wisdom, but as what can be enlarged as it is welded to imagination. In other words, common sense would be defined by the ability to deal pragmatically, imaginatively, and without confusion with the many things we know and the many abstractions that are relevant for knowing them. Common sense then, for Whitehead, is not prisoner of abstractions. It is rather able, if welded, to imagine <coughs> the narrative, to entertain abstractions as view for feelings. It is what both science fiction writers and ethnographers trust when trying to interest their readers in different worlds and different ways to have the world matter. In brief, I would propose that common sense, as understood by Whitehead, has no special true trouble accepting the situated character of any knowledge. It is rather an artist in matters of situatedness. 
it is of theoretical words and philosophical concepts that confront us with the di dilemma. Either they situate their users as the educators of humanity, or their users resort to irony, reducing claims, demands, and patience to a matter of, of for polite conversation. That is, they give up the value of rationalism as an adventure of hope. Whitehead wrote that we have no right to deface the value experience, which is the very essence of the universe. What we may have to give up, however, is the excess of subjectivity that taints whatever we call truth. This, I would propose, is what Whitehead's philosophy is about. Never forfeiting the demands of truth, but adding still another demand that all truths be able to situate themselves, that, that is to present themselves in a civilized manner. It may be because Whitehead was a mathematician that he felt no qualm accepting truths as always situated. Since the Greek mathematicians have honored this clause, the self-evidence and beauty of the demonstrated mathematical truth. But they would never deny or don't play the adventurous construction of the demonstrative path, a path Hegel denounced as devious, because it may include embedding the initial question in a wider setting, which creates the possibility of the answer. This, as we know, is the reason why they gave for not reading. However, Whitehead here as elsewhere also inherits William James' trust, a trust which includes no guarantees, but situates us in the entangled adventures of a pluriverse in the making through the creation of always partial connections. William James wrote, we can and we may, as it were, jump with both feet of the ground into or towards a world of which we trust the other parts to meet or jump. And only so can the making of a perfected world of the pluralistic pattern ever take place. Only through our precursive trust in it can it come into being. We can jump, and it is only mistrust with its demand for warranty which guarantee against irrational belief that leads to deface and denounce what I would call the speculative germ. The germ towards something that cannot be derived from the settled ground of matters of fact. It can be said that Whitehead, as a mathematician, knew that James' speculative trust is the very blood enabling the mathematician's creative work. In Adventure of Ideas, Whitehead proposed that the speech of Pericles to the Athenians should replace the book of the apocalyptic revelation as the final book in the Christian Bible. Pericles' speech presupposes trust in a vital possibility, the production of a, a contrasted unity among Athenians, weaving together and not denying their, their diversity. And the collective experience he activated is the very experience of William James, pluriverse in the making, the fragile but cosmic achievement of the felt experience of contradictions being turned into contrast, and of divergent adventures celebrating their need of each other in order for each to explore its own possibility of attainment. Why that proposition to make Pericles part of the Holy Scriptures is not, I am convinced, the conclusion of a philosopher. It is rather a deep felt conviction that contributed to turn Whitehead into a philosopher. He was no Pericles, and he was not a Quaker either, even if he paid homage to the Quaker spirituality when he characterized the way each occasion as engaging its own immediate self-realization is also concerned with the universe, emphasizing that he was using the word concern in the quicker sense of the term. But he himself trusts the possibility to turn the unruly crowd of our conflicting concepts 
into a pattern of contrasts. Using Whitehead's own remark that two philosophers are needed for a philosophy, uh, philosophical school to perform its first service to philosophy, I would even suggest that Whitehead situated himself as the one who came after William James, reducing to rigid consistency James' exploration of experience. Furthermore, I would propose that Whitehead's adventure as a philosopher is itself a pluralist one, exhibiting uh, the relation between the Jamesian precursor's trust and the experience of the mathematician, who knows that the jump cannot be dissociated from the grand concepts. <coughs> you never trust in general, and you never jump in general. Any jump is situated and situatedness here is not limited. If a jump is always situated, it is because its point is not to escape the ground in order to get access to a higher realm. For a mathematician, the jump connecting this ground, always this ground, with what, is, what was alien to it, as the necessity of an answer, the ground itself is crying out for new dimensions. In concept of nature, a first cry resounds against the bifurcation. All we know of nature is in the same boat, to sink or swim together. It defines a speculative challenge as a commitment. There will be no halfway house, no psychic addition that unifies the beauty of the sunset and the, its objective interpretation in terms of electromagnetic waves. This cry enfolds the radical consequence of the definition Whitehead had initially given. Nature is what we are aware of in perception. Awareness is calling for a jump, but mutely so. Indeed, the constraint defining the towards of the jump is left undefined. Whitehead commits himself to a speculative realism when he adds the following very common sequel I quote, we are instinctively willing to believe that by due attention more can be found in nature than that which is observed at first sight, but we will not be content with less. Whitehead does not demand guarantees ascertaining the definition of nature. He demands that nature be approached as liable to reward due attention. He does not specify how we will discriminate the kind of attention which is due in different situations. He rather commits himself at the very point Kant, Kant took uh, the inverse commitment, writing that we do not learn from nature, but impose on it our questions as a judge with a convict. That nature must be such that the way we pay attention to it makes a difference is not a definition of nature as noble. Certainly, when a mountain climb climber envisages a rock face in terms of the foothold it offers, she pays attention to the mountain in terms of possibilities of climbing. But the climber is not crazy. She knows that the mountains offer other opportunities, other footholds for many other kinds of beings from birds in grass, moss, and fungi. As a speculative realist, Whitehead will demand that nature be such that it offers footholds that do not privilege our intellectual abstractions. Our perceptive organs are also concerned, and more generally, the various equipments of any living being, as they all affirm that the lack of discrimination may exact a death penalty. The concept of objects making ingression and the contrast between events, which when they are born are born and objects which may be there again, are not some phenomenological rendering of our experience. They are the white Indian answer to the call of what we are aware of against bifurcation. A very carefully crafted answer indeed, precisely satisfying white realist demand. Very often, philosophers' initial commitment 
strangely enough, results in the production of some master key, as is the case, for instance, with the famous Cogito Ebrosu. Descartes took the Cogito as his only ground for certainty, and it finally gave Descartes the means to escape all uncertainty and proceed to the at last, at last rational conquest of everything there is to know. In contrast, white generality organized around the concept of nature are crafted in order not to conquer anything, rather to resist any demand that we define reality independently of how it matters for us. More generally, white realism is aiming at constraining our abstract definitions, never to deny what they require. If any natural knowledge is situated by the attention, by the kind of attention we pay, by how we discriminate what matters and what does not, it must never authorize abstractions that would deny the relevance of such attention or discrimination, that is, uh, that would erase situatedness. I would propose this is, this is an ethical point about all white Indian abstraction. The craft of white answer as opposed to the Cartesian conquest, give me a world and I will define the world, God included, thus makes the difference between jumping off the pond and mysteriously getting speculative wings and the power of surveying the whole landscape. Jumping is not made for the thinker to fly over, rather, as with the famous image of the airplane flight, to land again with renewed attention and imaginative question. And this will be the case even when Whitehead's philosophy will become openly speculative in process and reality. I am aware that some Whiteheadian scholars consider Whitehead's speculative proposition that occasions are the only resveral as defective. Not only reality would be incredibly atomic, but even less, even less able than physics to account for the enduring and obstinate thingness of things. Indeed, occasions are essentially transient. Surely when they perish as subject, they are not born as concept of nature event, but they are at the mercy of new occasions, which will have to take them into account, but will be free to determine how they will do so. The paradox here is that the concept of organism in science and modern world was rather strikingly providing but seemed to lack in process and reality. An organism is that which endures. It is limited, obstructive, intolerant, infecting its environment with its own, its own aspect. Value as it corresponds to the mode of achievement of what endures means first of all partiality, the drawing together in its own selected mode of the larger world in which each enduring being is situated. In process and reality, organisms are still referred to, and White still speaks about this philosophy as a philosophy of organisms. But critics are right, endurance and value are now divorced. Endurance designates societies, a derivative notion only, since it, is, it characterizes an excuse that is a gathering and not a real togetherness. Real togetherness and value now designate actual occasion, but actual occasions are not obstructive or intolerant. When they are passed into objective immortality, they are available to appropriation. However, there is no paradox if we admit that we deal with distinct, not contradictory, but consistent <coughs> jumps or leaps. Not only each white alien concept dramatically exhibits the general truth that any of our words is mutually appealing for an imaginative leap, but the leap, uh, his concept appeal 
for cannot be dissociated from the question that situates them. Organism, we have the answer to science and the modern world leading question, that of the order of nature. This order is not what we are aware of in perception. It is what we depend upon for the maintaining of bodily life, what interpretative perception trusts for better and worse, as it is permeat permeated with anticipation, and finally, what scientists put faith into when they do not just proceed by generalization from observed facts, but struggle to have these facts testify to a more general functioning that would characterize nature. That is when they are realist. The order of nature is thus a matter of multiple concern, each with its own way of making it matter. The concept of organism is the attempt to answer to the call for a pluralist unity in contrast with our dominant scientific abstractions which identify unity as a truth beyond the diversity. Whitehead's germ answering this call was radical in oath. Again, the abstraction derived from physics, <coughs> it, uh, these germs came to demand taking no continuity for granted, rather defining any endurance as a particular achievement with its selected value and always dependent on what Whitehead called the patience of the environment with regards to the way an organism infects it, to the role an organism assigns to it. <coughs> Whitehead proposing organism as a unifying concept may be correlated to the task he assigned to philosophy, to take care of our modes of abstraction. The choice of terms like infection or patients is deliberately crafted to call for intuition against the authority of explanation. Any explanation or justification requires the endurance of what they explain. Not only the explanation, but the very characterization of, of what is to be explained are relative to what endurance makes matter. They are situated as they require, as they require and take advantage of what uh, we cannot ever be take, take, we cannot ever take for granted. Endurance. As such, the concept of organism was meant to renew the realist faith in the order of nature, a plural order, because each science confronts distinct contrasts between patients and impatience. This contrast is dominant in historical, psychological, and social sciences, while the trust in endurance shapes the abstraction and explanations of physics. But organisms were named to indicate the now privileged position of biology, where endurance is exhibited as an achievement where mutual infection is the rule and the patient's impatient contrast is transformed into an entangled, into entangled patterns of mutually intra-action, to borrow Karen Barak's term. When the developing embryo is concerned, this contrast is even woven into a dramatic plot, the unfolding of which contemporary biologists just begin now to discover. I would propose that organisms link realism and speculation in a very concrete sense, a sense that rather directly questions what we call a thing. Indeed, using this term may well unilaterally emphasize endurance, as when we contemplate a mountain. Organisms, in contrast, as they make Continuing endurance and achievement exhibit that to be real is not to be self-sustaining. Contemplating a mountain, or for that matter, a spoon or a chair, <coughs> corresponds to a particular uh, to a particular case. It is to address a, a the general case. Is to address a thing. Uh, no. It corresponds to a particular 
case, contemplating a thing and maybe wondering what we can know about it. The general case is that addressing some being as real is a matter of speculative concern. What does this being require for being itself? What may disrupt its way of enduring? Scientists claim for realism is verified by their very concern that the environment they impose upon what they address in order to question it does not irreparably distort the answer they get. The problem is rather different for the police inquirer interrogating a suspect, for the marketing man wishing people to buy what they don't need, for the political activist trying to activate citizens' impatience, or for the therapist helping somebody to escape an enduring sufferance. But whatever the concern, there is no answer without a groping, speculative experimentation, as when one gets acquainted with somebody with her zones of robustness and her zones of fragility. Speculation, not contemplation or vision, testifies for the reality of what we address. When White had made actual occasion the only resveral, he took a last daring jump. But again, a situated one, which may be associated with the demand of what he calls the metaphysical standpoint, I put in science and modern world. We will forget the peculiar problems of modern science and we put ourselves at the standpoint of a dispassionate consideration of the nature of things. Organism and the order of nature will then become a particular application. The introduction of the new name, society, for what endures may well be indicative that here that social and historical sciences, not biology, have become the leading reference. While endurance is a matter of wonder for biologists, it calls for a dispassionate attitude for the social scientist. What matters instead is the possible as such, as exhibited by stability and disruption, hope and despair, rebellion and repression, claims and doubts, propagation of new ideas and justifications of their silencing by the need to defend society. What I would insist upon is that dispassionate consideration does not refer at all to a vision of truth beyond the illusion produced by patient or partiality. The obstinate endurance of organism is no illusion. Endurance is derivative because of the very passionate partiality of the goal which White had now and which White had new jump was answering to. The ground White had is now jumping with both feet off demands that the possible as such be justified as well as a hope for relevant novelty without which there would be no jump. Correlatively, Forgetting peculiar problems of science, for instance, does not mean that accessing the nature of things demands reaching a contemplative experience when nothing matters any longer. It rather means that something else is mattering. What matters now, what must be civilized, is philosophy itself and its addiction for a truth beyond illusion. The challenge of a dispassionate consideration is thus emphatically not entailing a jump towards a hidden reality behind the scene. The first definition of resveral is that there are creatures of creativity, and creativity is not some supreme truth, but what must be equally and without privilege exemplified by any of its creatures. Any is now the challenge. Far from being some kind of speculative vision, this challenge requi requires from us philosophers the highest degree of partiality, resisting our most cherished habit of thought, leaving no, st no stone unturned if we are to practice what Bruno Latour called irreduction. From the metaphysical standpoint, nothing can ever be gifted to 
good goal of explaining anything else. All our deaths and our therefore are productions exemplify creativity. Why did Walt? No reason internal to history can be assigned why that flux of forms, rather than another flux, should have been illustrated. The ultimate freedom of things lying beyond all determination was whispered by Galileo, a prosimove. Freedom for the inquisitors to think wrongly, for Galileo to think rightly, and for the world to move in in despite of Galileo and the inquisitors. This ultimate freedom of things which divorces the new uh, speculative resvera from endurance is referred to an immediate experience we should never deface because it is ultimate freedom. It is the foundation of our experience of responsibility, of approbation, of disapprobation, of self-approval, of self-reproach, freedom of emphasis, foundation of all experience, an experience that crucially matters when we celebrate, as we can say, the ascent of man with the conscious, passionate feeling of solitude and maybe the problem that can we know, but an experience which should be civilized, why sh uh, we should not have the power to give, its to give its universal foundation to human freedom and responsibility. This passionate consideration rather turns it into a situating constraint. If our own adventure puts such an emphasis on individual freedom, we should not justify it, but go all the way with it, never denying it to anything we name real. This passionate consideration does not demand a disavowal of passion, accept, accepting in a dispassionate way what White had called the multifi multifariousness of the world, the fairy dance and crisis nailed on the, to the cross. And I would add, philosophers claim we are prisoners of Plato's cave. Whatever or many ways to access what we call reality, they are all passionate, as they all imply learning how to pay due attention and accessing metaphysical reality is no different. It only proposes that due attention be paid to all the short shortcuts which one way or another permit first to hide a rabbit in the hat and then to triumphantly discover it and discover with it the way to privilege some selected passionate interest, making them a what feminist research is called an unmarked gender, able to evaluate everything else. That is why the situating constraint why that puts into action in processing reality is a prohibition of any shortcut that makes such tricks possible. This constraint is what White had named the ontological principle, actual entity are the only reasons, so that the search for a reason is to search for one or more actual entities. Adopting this very demanding principle imposed to White his major imaginative lead, leaps including his final concept of God. It's time to conclude, I believe. If philosophy is to weld an always situated common sense and the adventure of imagination, philosophers are to learn to value both the imaginative experience and the craft of welding, of adding new relevant, always partial, never innocent <coughs> dimensions and contrast to what may appear as a well-defined situation. Daring an openly speculative realism in processing reality, why they did not dream the usual philosophical dream of converting everybody to philosophical truths, getting them, everybody out of the cave. He, he rather designed a device, or what he called a matrix, uh, that would enable philosophers to learn this craft of welding, to learn how to tell stories 
that would open common sense to the adventure of a world in the making. This, at least, is how I did in a little and the irreducible plurality of the answer I proposed to what may seem to amount to the same question, what is reality? I learned that the hope for any kind of answer to a what is question, if it aims at muting a crowd of divergent concerns and patience, and not at, elucidate, at elucidating a well-situated problem, aims at muting important value experiences. Why did wrote very classically that philosophy begins with wonder, but he added that when philosophic thought has done its best, the wonder remains. Why, why did has done its very best? With him, wonder does not simply remain. The web of abstraction he has woven induces the attention needed to protect it, beginning with the wonder of what we call common sense. Trusting, trusting not this or that common sense idea, but the capacity of common sense to be welded with imagination is required by the welding operation. And that kind of trust may also be today a matter of life and death, or more precisely, of civilization and barbarity. provocation to the sort of curiosity that I think she's elaborating for us. And in some notes that she sent me, she talked about having learned mathematics uh, with, one, having, with one who taught her to, learn, to love something, to become available to something as a kind of act of, of jumping, of learning to trust. And I've, I've found Isabel's work over many years now a kind of provocation to jump from somewhere to take a leap um, in the face of what is perhaps more of um, a, a temptation to fright, I think, in our times than perhaps ever on this planet. This is not a geological era named the Anthropocene for nothing. Um, then that's the um, intuition and the uh, confidence out of which I want to offer these thoughts in response to this paper. And I'm, I'm calling my response um, wonder in the SF mode, or situating wonder. And I'm using the notion of SF in a way that I think Isabel also is in the paper she just read for us, and reminding us that SF means science fiction, of course, but speculative fabulation, speculative feminism, scientific fact, speculative fact, uh, that it has a deep tie to what is being called speculative realism, that kind of open risk or dare of speculative reality, that kind of inhabiting that which is not yet what may be, or perhaps that which might have but been but is no longer, the kind of speculative worlding that takes the risk of not knowing where one is, but perhaps making a jump in the sense of Battlestar Galactica, a jump on which the very survival of a remnant might rest a jump that is still perhaps a search for an earth that maybe never was or will be found fully destroyed, but perhaps nonetheless there is something which may yet be, or as Isabel says, Whitehead talks about our abstractions or the speculative adventure as the, the risk of crafting something that makes the possibility of a relevant novelty possible. So uh, uh, the, I want to juxtapose this with a question asked by another speculative friend of mine, an anthropologist in Australia named Everbird Rose, who has a new, dog, a new book out called Wild Dog Dreaming, in which she talks about the death work or the double death of killing ongoingness that those of us on this planet today confront. She asks, what does it mean to write, to think, in a time of human-induced mass extinctions, exterminations, and multi-species genocides. That we have perhaps never lived in a time on this planet as a species 
where the temptation to critique is stronger and where the need to resist critique for some kind of building of something else, some kind of still possible elsewhere, um, lures us to perhaps some kind of flourishing on a blasted planet. So that <coughs> Isabel argues with Whitehead that an organism, which is not an organismic concept in Whitehead, as Jim, uh, Jim Bono, James Bono emphasized to me again in Walking Over, that Whitehead's organism is precisely not organismic in the romantic philosophical sense, but is a kind of uh, ongoing and risky multiple infection of patterns holding in part a kind of partial connections that Marilyn Strathairn talked about. That the organisms, uh, that organisms in Whitehead sense depend upon the patience of what it infects. And I would argue, I think, um, with, with Marilyn Strathairn, with Deborah Bird Rose, I think with Isabel, I think with many others, that the patience of our world, that the patience of Terra is at an end uh, for our modes of abstraction and indeed for our modes of life. That, it, that we are facing what it means to write in a time of extinctions and exterminations in way more than a figural sense. And that we had better do it, not with fright, but with some kind of leap, some kind of trust that might be in the science fiction mode, the speculative fabulation mode, what are some of the women talked about as the carrier bag theory of fiction, that way of keeping the story goal going when the old story can no longer be told. So Marilyn Strathairn also argues for us and with us that it matters which concepts we use to think other concepts with. So it matters which abstractions we use to do other abstractions with, which abstractions infect each other so as to make some other sort of abstraction possible that might be a technical means of welding common sense to imagination for the just barely still possible relevant novelty. But perhaps what we're after is actually not novelty exactly, even though I too am wedded and welded to the notions of creativity, innovation, invention, novelty. I was infected by process philosophy when I think I was still haploid. And I, I know that when 90% of me is not human cells, that I am welded and infected uh, with the kind of multi-species Sympoesis, not autopoesis, uh, that I think uh, Whitehead and his friends teach. Nonetheless, I have become more and more and more suspicious of what Lee Edelman in his book on reproductive futurity might complain about in the way that process philosophy grew out of, has as its matrix, its field of possibility, the figure of a child, the notions and practices of progress the privileging of the new and the invention and what is to come and facing the future and that somehow inheriting the past has to be about facing the future. And these figures and practices of futurity and creativity and invention and novelty are perhaps what Terra has lost patience with. And the abstractions of process philosophy perhaps need a bit of tinkering. So for that, I turn uh, to what if the angel of history were a dog, another of Deborah Bird Rose's paper, where she's actually talking about dingoes, not my cayenne, which is a big pity, but nonetheless, <laughs> she's talking about the practices of, of, uh, of extermination of dingoes as vermin, as well as the celebrating them as the charismatic macro, macro fauna of the Australian state. She's talking about the doubleness within which these dogs are forced to live their current lives as they are ripped out of the worlds, um, which are already xenobiological worlds, in which they do life together in country with various aboriginal owners of country, uh, traditional owners of the land, various, various ways of doing living that were never not historical, but are certainly not what they are now. Now, Deborah Rose, from her teachers in the Yerlin area of Northern Australia, the Northern Territories, talks about a set of different way of thinking temporality that I want to juxtapose to some of the notions of temporality and futurity that I think Whitehead's abstractions 
are, are still very much um, infected by, both in the good and the bad sense of infection. In particular, she says her teachers taught us, taught her, that any serious lawman, that is to say any serious adult in the Aboriginal communities in the Ireland River, River area with whom she was working for a number of years and with, which, with whom she has done a number of land claims and trying to figure out how to make legible certain modes of documentation that don't take the form of a text the law knew how to read, how to archive certain kinds of records, how to turn into text various kinds of trackings or dreamings, these kinds of very interesting cobblings which are certainly relevant new novelties. These are certainly weldings of, of various kinds of situated common sense in order to world otherwise in the law. She says the lawmen who have instructed her said, look, any serious person, any serious adult in the world gets it that his or her obligation is to face those who came before. To face those who came before, which is not the past, but it is the, the, the time of worlding, the time of dreaming, and the way it comes to us in Anglo-English, in, in colonial Anglo-English, Anglo it's the dreaming. But it's that to face those who came before, uh, who are in a kind of temporality separated from what might be called, uh, by Anglo-English speakers, the present. But the present is not this vanishing pivotal point that is always this, this place of instantaneous transition. It's not the present in the sense of, of the time that White had complained about with its misplaced concreteness. It's not the time of physics. It is, in fact, a rather interesting hundred-yearish time. It's the time of you can still tell the stories that somebody living heard from somebody who was living when they heard the story. It's the time of living storytelling. That might be the present. That is the time of those whose obligation is to face those who came before, so as to practice those sorts of things that leave the mark of the care of generations to those who come behind, whom you never face. Um, that the, the generations to come are those who literally come behind. And your obligation as a serious person is to live in this time of living storytelling, to face those who came before, in order to leave the marks of the care of generations, a continuity of caring practices. But that continuity of caring practices is never, uh, one cannot know in advance what they have to be. Um, that the continuity of caring practices, however, are what will leave quiet country and not wild country to those who come after. So what would it be to leave more quiet country rather than wilderness? which for the teachers that Deborah Rose was talking to, <coughs> wilderness meant the erasure of the marks of care, the, the massive erosions, the double death, the, the production of extinctions. Death is not the problem, but the killing of ongoingness, the human-induced mass, mass extinctions and genocides that have been the story, surely, of the 20th and 21st centuries. Perhaps not uniquely. There are other times of extinctions and genocides. But our times, what shall we call them? Whitehead's moment of, of writing after the Great War? Whitehead's time writing after the blasting of generations of World War I? Surely that was no more quiet country than after the blastings uh, of the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, or the blastings of the Holocaust of World War II, or the crashing extinctions that are euphemized under something called climate change that Christians want to address with something called creation care. And then there are the sneering scientists who have nothing to do with creation care. Um, very well, maybe that's, that's getting me off track. <laughs> <laughs> but what I've done here, in a very condensed way, is talk about another set of idioms for a situated common sense that does a certain kind of temporality that does not privilege futurity. It doesn't privilege relevant novelty. It privileges, rather, relevant, um, uh, relevant tracking those who came before, which is everybody as, much, as bit as much, I would suggest, an inventive practice, or a welding practice. It is a crafting or a worlding practice. But it specifically doesn't invoke the figures of creativity 
or of futurity, or of the risk of the greater nature of what comes next. Now, I'm not suggesting that I, or we, or Isabel, or Whitehead, or anybody else, walk away from, I think, the extremely rich inheritance of the ways of doing temporalities, including futurities, um, including the sort of queer, non-reproductive, multi-species, infectious ways of doing generations that we can even do now quite technically. There is a way in which evolutionary ecological developmental biology and its biomolecular apparatuses can actually do something other than heteronormativity that our queer theorists have only dreamed of. Uh, there is a way in which I continue to learn from the idioms of biology in, among other things, my family forming practices. Uh, these ways that speculative feminisms and speculative uh, theorizings, the speculative whirlings of the SF world, in which I include queer theory as a fundamental uh, you know, contributor to, to all of this. I'm not suggesting that we walk away from these multiple inheritances of infection, but I am suggesting that if we're serious about living now and here, not in some kind of carping, critical, moralistic, weirdo, post-colonial, uh, you know, why aren't you talking about the Australian Aboriginals? Not that kind of scolding, you should be doing something else. Okay? But rather, it is no longer good enough. It is no longer true that we don't know more than we, in fact, practice. We actually do now know a great deal from speaking and writing and ethnography and history and conferencing and engagements and indeed with the, relative, the, new, the relevant novelty of indigeneity, which was produced in the 90s, the, global, the globalization movements of production of, of production of global indigeneities, for example, which was certainly something that didn't exist on this planet before, the global indigenous um, movements, the global worlding that went on, that <coughs> produced various modes of entanglement and encountering of common senses, of situated idioms, abstractions, modes of thinking, modes of interrupting, that seem to me really critical if Terra is to remain the least bit patient. That it's no longer okay, in other words, for philosophers in particular, or scientists, biologists, or folks like me, it is truly no longer possible to say, but this is what I learned, and this is what we got from Pericles on, and these are our abstractions and we need to take care of them. I believe that's perfectly true. We do absolutely need the practice of the care of the mark of generations and taking care of our abstractions. But I think we are not very good at getting it that the questions require not just the inventions of new abstractions out of this toolkit, but learning other people's abstractions. Um, Isabel has been very good at learning the abstractions of the neo-pagan witches. And if people in this room think that talking about God in the academy is out of line, I dare you to talk about the neo-pagan witches. <laughs> or to be serious about the goddess as an abstraction of serious, that is seriously needed in talking about something like disclosure or in somehow making someone like Heidegger no longer quite so poor in world. Um, that, that if one is really serious about the kinds of um, uh, invent the, the kinds of interrupted and entangled abstractions, it's no longer good enough to do this from the Greek song. And we know more than we let ourselves know. We have colleagues, we have friends, we have conferences, we have books, we have all sorts of stuff. Not to be the scolding post-colonial, but actually not to let philosophy or science or any of the rest of it any longer be that unmarked set of categories. Um, that uh, our, our abstractions are too poor in world. So if we're going to take that leap of trust from our own situated ground, that is to say we do know something. In fact, we know rather a lot. And owning up to knowing something is the only way to be a serious person. But owning up to knowing something about living and writing in a time of human-induced mass exterminations and mass genocides is actually about figuring out what those other abstractions are to think with if Tara is not to totally lose patience with these organisms uh, whose endurance is now seriously at stake. So that's what I mean by the SF mode, or as a, a graduate student who recently finished in my world called, in a dissertation, Far-Fetchings, 
on and in the SF mode. He was working with Ursula Le Guin's far fetchings and her notions of talking backwards and her people who have their heads screwed on backwards. Well, I, I'm kind of interested in screwing our heads on backwards in Deborah Bird Rose's sense to wonder what process was that we might be like if we weren't so much looking for relevant novelty as what relevant something else, somewhere, it's not a relevant past, but it's something that isn't quite so enamored of the new and of creative and of whatever it is that the West thinks it does, which has done, which it has done such that Terra's run out of patience. I think that's enough. going to move straight to questions. Um, I know some people, I don't know everybody. Uh, I'm going to try and be fair. Um, so, uh, who wants to go first? I have a question for Professor um, Darrow. Donna. Other questions? Donna. Donna. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much for both of you coming. I just wanted to talk about abstraction of affection and the way that the word, like, the, the language of affection that we use with, like, the production of extermination, particularly within human-produced um, abstraction of affection, like, the, the 1980s AIDS crisis and how that applies to uh, applying social change, getting to these things where we can actually look backwards and forward and into the future, and how we can get rid of these abstractions of extermination. You want to get rid of the abstraction of extermination. Yeah. Well, I kind of want to stay with it. Stay with it. I, I mean, I actually think that extinctions are happening at an extraordinary rate that is extraordinarily difficult to deal with with the perceptual apparatus of a bipedal hominid. So we have this extremely helpful instrumentarium to get at the um, fact of human-induced mass extinction. It's an, it's an interpretation. In that sense, it's, an abs it's certainly an abstraction and an interpretation. But I have no interest in getting rid of the abstraction. I have some interest in slowing down <laughs> the operation. No, that, that, no, that, that was clear. Okay. By the way, I think I actually have a term for this, the, the relevant novel, something that is a kind of a synonym for what Whitehead means by the relevant novelty. And Isabel, in another place in her notes that she gave me, talks about the work to be done. And it's the relevant work or the relevant play. It's not so much whether it's new or old or inventive or novelty or not, but it's uh, that which is to be done. Um, it seems to me that Whitehead is very good at provoking us to carry. It matters what is to be done. That isn't just the old 19th century Russian nihilist question. Uh, and it's very interesting that it's a nihilist question, in a way, that, that, that what is to be done seems to me what Whitehead is really about, and that we overuse the, the figural um, seductions of novelty. Yes, but if I can, it is true that I was from time to time uh, uh, also perturbed by the, uh, the, the importance of novelty in Whitehead, uh, because it's so like a, a, a static tradition and we are the vector of novelty and all that. Uh, but it seems to me that for Whitehead, and it is, it is the way I understand him, uh, relevant is maybe more important than novelty, which means connections. What was disjunctive? comes to play together. And this, I would say, uh, this may be said in many ways. Uh, it is novel because uh, what we were indifferent to now may make a difference. So this interest to the, the, the way others may ma make matter their world and then. all this can be said from our standpoint, but we are situated. It's relevant 
uh, the, the, the task to be relevant with regards to that knowledge is a production of novelty because we were not, we were uneven. So, uh, or a no, production no, of memory. It yes, be, uh, but he would say, he would say, I think, production of memory is... Well, no memory so for me, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But perhaps the product, the novelty that, that, that uh, I, me, need, it is not at all a novelty for someone else. Exactly. But indeed, they're very conditions of uh, no longer being uh, able to be ongoing. I mean, I think of the, um, for example, the earth, the, rel the wrist earthquake in Haiti, uh, and the um, the what what it takes to produce a relevant novelty in the North American public in terms of getting a grip about what is not a natural disaster, um, in terms of getting at the connections that are so built into the situation uh, that the grasp, somehow coming, the grasp of that might be a relevant novelty for those who are brought to care. Um, but it's the, but, um, it's the grasp of the conditions of living and dying, uh, and I don't know if that's making any sense, including what constitutes flourishing. There's plenty that's novel here, but it's not all to be invented. Some of it is to be learned uh, as a first grader because, because it is well known. <coughs> so I just want to say first that I really appreciated the talks. Um, and both of you use the term uh, speculative realism. Um, and, and both of you also um, really emphasized uh, the use of, of Donna's term, I believe, situated knowledge. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to ask after uh, how you think about the relation between those, because in the way that it's often been uh, discussed, um, speculative realism is thought to be something which is about you know, a critique of so-called correlationism um, and uh, the possibility of, of thinking in itself and thinking the absolute. Um, perhaps in a manner which um, might be taken to be incompatible um, with, uh, with an emphasis on situated knowledges. And I ask the question not to sort of ask you to criticize speculative realism on those grounds or to criticize situated knowledges from the position of speculative realism, but rather to ask both of you maybe if you could, if you could talk about um, how you understand a, a kind of situated objectivity. Bonnie, you've just mentioned. Uh, very helpful instrumentarium, uh, which expands our uh, perceptual capacities. Um, and Isabel, you mentioned, uh, you know, Whitehead's great passage on the sunset, the concept of nature, um, and amplifying, again, what we know about the natural. Um, and so how both of you think about technology and science um, as a production of sort of situated objectivities, um, if, if indeed that might be a way of well, I, I think that uh, uh, my efforts, the my efforts, other people like Bruno Latour efforts is to make uh, uh, non separable what we call objectivity and the equip equipment and to make it not contradictory, to, to separate with the dream light of some kind of objective vision by separation from illusion to say objectivity is produced and happily so. And it will, it says, it is the more interesting, the more, uh, the, the way it is produced is, uh, is understood. So uh, objectivity is not a philosophical theme. And it has nothing to do with thing and the thingness of thing. Objectivity is, uh, Objectivity is always situated, it is always a matter of concern, and as such situated by the kind of concern, while maybe a th the thinness of thing may be a matter of many concerns, of the plurality of concerns. Uh, yeah, I mean, Isabel and I play cat's cradle with each other. Uh, this relaying of string figures, uh, that, where the patterns really matter. Um, and I think both of us, and I, and I think Bruno Latour and many others, are committed to the notion 
that the last thing in the world anybody needs is explaining something with by something else so as to explain it away. And that the, the, certain kinds of correlationism strike me to take that form uh, in certain kinds of uh, certain kinds of critical practice, very important and dominant kinds of critical practice, uh, with, with which we can do without. That's a legal sense. Uh, that uh, that the to take something seriously is not to explain it by something else. Is to be at risk to it, to be available to it, to somehow um, be undone and redone in the uh, encounter, and that's a kind of that I would regard as speculative thought, or something like that. And it certainly will involve all sorts of operations, maybe even including certain kinds of statistical correlation. I don't know. That's not the problem. Uh, but uh, the, the that that um, being at risk to the thisness of something. Uh, before running off to try to explain it in terms of something else. Uh, that uh, is one of the things that Isabel and Bruno taught me to say. Now, speculative realism is a term I'm learning to use in a sentence. Uh, and I feel like I, I need to use it in a sentence ten times as some sort of staying after school assignment. Uh, I mean, facetious slightly. It strikes me as the new kid on the block that has adopted a label for itself. Now I'm really being mean. <laughs> All kinds of extremely interesting things are going on under that label, however. Okay. So I am tempted to try to live on the block and see if I can rent out an apartment. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's what happens when one meets a creative new move that is maybe not so new and carves out a territory and whatever, it leaves out most of the girls, and that always makes me mad. I get very, very grumpy when all the new names seem to be attached to a certain kind of... But you see my problem. Uh, uh, I am a, I, my, my passions are not obscure. Okay. And yet, I've been seduced. I'm curious. I'm interested. I'm intrigued in what's going on on this block. Okay. And so, I will appro I'm an appropriative sort of person. I cut and read. Um, and appropriate, and try, you know, see, see what it does in my neighborhood, uh, and then, and so on and so on. But that's exactly what I think, uh, that's how I experience Whitehead talking, I mean, Isabel talking about Whitehead. That is Pensez avec Whitehead in a Stenarian mode, in my reading, in my Cat's Cradle game with you. Um, in that, uh, it's a sort of, uh, there's a precision needed, there is a, a taking this mode of doing a philosophical inquiry seriously and not necessarily sounds like that immediately, you know, analogizing it to something else and stealing it. But it's also being at risk of being interrupted by it in such a way that you don't use your own abstractions in quite the same way again. Okay. So there's no question that situated knowledges, which grows out of a particular moment in the history of U.S. feminism, which was a moment of saying, hey guys, we, the last thing in the world we need is downward mobility of the mind. The last thing in the world we need is some kind of anti-science feminism. Okay? And objectivity is a precious achievement, let's not toss babies in backwaters. Okay? And that situated knowledges have to do with a, uh, a situated does not mean local, <laughs> in the sense of, of some sort of I am local uh, and, uh, you know, my, my I, you know, I have a, a National Heritage Park called the local. <laughs> the situated knowledges are at risk. Um, and, they, and to tying in new threads, to, to holding onto this knot and not some other one, to claiming to know something, not to be, to claiming to know. And it seems to me one of the beauties of the natural sciences is that they can to indeed make very strong and obligatory claims to know some things. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and they're not <coughs> optional nor are they universal. Okay. Uh, but that universals in that same sense, in a beautiful book, Friction, universals are built, and universals are precious achievements, and they're very fragile. And we could use some durable universals these days. Not in the old sense of, 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 a, general, of a general or a universal, but we could use some built big stories. We could use some big stories that really hold us together. And to do that is going to take being at risk in some novel ways. So that's what I mean by situatedness. Um, and, and truly speculative realism strikes me as a, as a relatively recent um, proposition of a holding together that is partly oppositional, 
sitting in the currents and in philosophical toolkits, but also partly invitational. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of more curious about the invitations than the oppositions, which is why I'll even still hold on to Heidegger's open, in spite of all the trouble. But I'll hold on to almost anything that still is presented as an invitation. <clears throat> if I may add something about Kailash, if I begin my talk with a uh, uh, white uh, idea that what do we know was transformed uh, into what can we know, uh, this was the beginning of the true correlation, correlationism <coughs> tradition. So uh, my curiosity, because I it's a novelty and I, I, I am not completely, uh, I, am, I am here also to listen and to understand, is how much, uh, is it not still in the what can we know tradition? Or is it escaping the what can we, we know? Is it accepting Kant and then trying to escape? Or is it as, well, as I think what they did, trying to, 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 to be, to, to, to answer to all what we know, anyway. So, so this is my, my, my uh, I don't know what I'm thinking about uh, the new uh, speculative realism thing, because I balance between a dramatization going on with Kant's proposition that is needing the correlationist opposition in order to, to, to speak, or uh, a new way to, to, to articulate what, what do we know. Uh, we have Jim and then Judith. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to come back to uh, Don, Don's, Don's comments about uh, temporality and maturity, uh, and I think the, the, the dramatic intervention that you make uh, uh, with them, I think certainly the way in which you contextualize it in terms of uh, a, a, you know, a you know, set of social, political practices and continuities of hearing and ask, I think make it very important and relevant question to, to be asking. And I wonder if that can uh, you know, take up uh, what this I was talking about, about relevant novelty, because it seems to me, uh, I mean, I quite agree with you. Um, but it seems to me also that in Whitehead, we don't have novelty as novelty. We have novelty always in connection with inheritance. So that it is that, in fact, one cannot have novelty without inheritance because it is only to the contrast of the data that, 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 uh, uh, that is the things in the world, in a sense, that are brought together in this new occasion uh, that one can have novelty. So novelty is always crafted uh, in and through inheritance, her whether one wants to call that past temporality or, 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 or whatever. So it seems to me that another way of thinking of it is using a phrase that uh, I'm fond of in, in, in my life, and this is the notion of the becoming of con continuity. That is, that continuity is something that is not pre established but is always made, but that continuity then is novel, that it is a novelty that brings with it. Uh, memories brings with it the physical memory, if you, if you a range of, uh, brings with it uh, the past or at least the present or the kind of present that we're talking about, an extended present, and that involves, uh, you know, yes, continuities like continuities here as well. So we don't think that what you're suggesting is really that far removed from Whitehead at all. I think it's not an opposition, but it might be a contrast worth staying with. And also I think that um, that becoming of continuity sounds a little different if one says becoming with, that all becoming is always becoming with, yes. with that with it, um, not known in advance and not preformed in advance exactly what Whitehead is doing. His abstractions allow one somehow to think that the partners truly are not pre-existent entrants into interaction, but in Karen Barad's sense, really are um, uh, in, 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 in pro-action. And that also one never starts from zero, that is, turtles all the way down, one never starts from scratch. 
Uh, and I, I think of the way that um, in, in Bruno's paper called Will Non-Humans Be Saved, he talks about St. Darwin, a really nice passage. <laughs> and he talks about uh, the understanding that, um, which I think is Whitehead's notion of, of organism, that uh, from the point of view of Darwinian biology, which has truly never been digested, is yet to be understood in its radical, non-futuristic, non-teleological, non-organismic sense, that uh, every single act of ongoingness, uh, action of ongoingness, is a becoming with that is at risk, among other things, for not continuing. And that um, the, the really normalized and domesticated and trivialized and tamed, um, which for a person who defends the domestic is really a bad set of metaphors, but <laughs> that to go on. Nonetheless, the, the, uh, these bad senses of domesticated and tamed notions of reproduction and were not Darwin's, that every organism is a risk in, in, uh, a risk in uh, ongoingness. Um, and that uh, what, what that, the, that uh, time is never the same as it was, and never guaranteed. Um, that's much closer, it seems to me, to what White is about. In fact, it is what he learned. To me, it, is, it was what he learned from White of most crucial mm -hmm. that any continuity is a reproduction. The, oh, 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 the always risky character of reproduction. Or what Judith Butler might is a re something. It isn't a, um, That's a word he used. I know, I know. I'm not sure it's the best, but it's a word he used. How to use these words seriously while interrupting at the, it, using them seriously and interrupting at the same time as using is a way, it, it, it's the, not irony, but a mode of, um, it seems to me laughter is a really critical philosophical tool. And that every single one of our abstractions must be used seriously and, and must be laughing at itself in its very use, mm -hmm. uh, in some way that the very statement of it is a bad joke. <laughs> Something. It's a matter of slowing down the physical. Yeah. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on time, so Judith and then Levi and, and Roland, but we are running out of time. So, um, I'm glad to get to uh, your turtles all the way down, because I'm wearing turtles all the way down. Hey, right. <laughs> uh, turtles in the round. That's right. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm so struck by the, the, the sort of um, verbal dynamic of this sort of quasi-debate about, you know, the, the sort of, is there sort of an excess of futurity in at least the metaphors and some of the constructive tools that we have in the process um, tradition in Whitehead? versus uh, an understanding of, of the notion of novelty and futurity as, you know, pardon the word, grounded in the notion of relevance and reproduction and continuity, et cetera. And, and it strikes me that maybe the way, it doesn't feel like there's an overall disagreement, but a moment of something coming out of this. And I wonder if the next place to attend is that for both of you, and both of your work and what you've presented here tonight, um, the question is one for us, right? It's a, it's a question of present urgency as to what we do as philosophers, right? And, and we, you know, it's kind of been traced out in this kind of formal lens about what are the conditions of talking about the kind of novelty language or the, the relevance language, but really how we're going to do this as philosophers is a question of some kind of effort now, some kind of again, part of a volitional act, but I'm not particular model of volition, but some kind of... Yeah. yeah. Um, and sure. I'm wondering if maybe, I'd like to hear either of you comment on, on the, the, the fact that maybe the, the place to resolve this or bring it to the next stage is to talk about the effort, the, the volitional, the, the, um, uh, the laborious dimension, because that's where it's going to, to get concrete, if, if we're talking about the project of memory you know, and trying to valorize that. Um, one has to make an effort at that. The, the kind of you know, memory that, that you were bringing up, it doesn't just happen. Someone has to do it, or it's not going to happen. I think it's about play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think volition and effort may be a bit misleading, because there is no dynamics in that. But 
I think what what needs effort is daring to 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 get out of the purely uh, philosophical tradition. Uh, the natural about my interest for neo-pagan witches and to 